Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, today is part two of our Detecting Advanced Threat series, and we're going to be focusing on the active threat inside your network. I'm Stacey Jambura, the Event Marketing Coordinator here at Live Action and your moderator for today. And I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Fast, Chief Data Scientist, and he's going to be running through our presentation today. During our webinar, as Dr. Fast is presenting, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter those into the chat box, and we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, so we'll make sure to address those at that point. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Andrew, and he's going to walk you through how to detect active threats within your network. Thanks, Stacey. Let's highlight our goals for today. So first, we're going to review a few standard operating procedures of advanced threat actors, uh, strategies and tactics that threat actors use to make detection particularly difficult. Well, we're going to describe strategies to support long-term analysis of network data, strategies to use data efficiently and effectively, uh, despite its volume and velocity, and then highlight a few use cases and detection approaches for low and slow activity, things like recon, exfiltration, uh, that threat actors are attempting to run under the radar. I think many of you are uh, fully experienced with uh, this fact uh, and or at least afraid of it, that there are only two types of companies, those that know they've been compromised and those that don't know. Uh, the obvious implication here is that everybody's been compromised. It's really just a difference, uh, a difference in knowledge, right? Do you know you've been compromised or not? And so the fact that threat actors are very commonly in networks already, particularly in large organizations, uh, makes it very challenging to detect. Because they're already in, they are also actively working to avoid detection. So a few common strategies that threat actors use, uh, living off the land, operating low and slow, and using encryption, all limit our ability as network to defenders, as network defenders to detect these behaviors. So let's dig in a little bit to each of them. First, living off the land. Living off the land uh, implies using what's available, right? Um, so attackers are using commonly available tools for recon, lateral movement, data transfer, uh, things like PowerShell, things like RDP, uh, Windows Remote Management, um, tools that are very commonly found in enterprise networks. In fact, not only are they just found in enterprise networks, uh, they are often most widely used to um, monitor and manage uh, the most critical pieces of infrastructure in an organization. Things like domain controllers, file servers, cloud resources, uh, those types of um, machines are not typically uh, accessed by a human directly, right? They don't have screens and keyboards. They're living in a server farm somewhere, uh, in a data center, um, or in the cloud, and are only connected to remotely. So the use of these remote execution tools, uh, file transfer tools are very, very common just in everyday usage. And of course, attackers are going to take advantage of that. Uh, living off the land is a benefit uh, for an attacker because it does not require custom malware. Custom malware has its own signatures. Uh, the, it provides uh, indicators that can be detected. Uh, if you're using common tools and using standard tools, uh, many of those indicators go away. So we have to turn to behavioral analytics uh, to make these detections because now even small, small usage will fall within the, the thresholds or the um, boundaries of normal usage, uh, which can be very difficult to detect out of the ordinary behavior. Uh, the second strategy that we'll talk about today is, uh, is called low and slow. Uh, as I mentioned, attackers are trying to stay under the radar, and so uh, large bursts uh, can easily be detected. Uh, those sorts of defenses are installed in many networks. Uh, scanning detection, for example, a, a burst of uh, pings or uh, port scan uh, can be 
very easily detected because they're over a short time frame. You don't need a lot of memory to track that behavior over time. So low and slow, this is happening. You know, little bits of data are being transferred over time. It blends into the background. Uh, it's not outside of the normal variability of a particular host because, as we know, things like data transfer rates do vary over time. Uh, they just tend not to vary widely. So if you transferred a whole lot of data at once, that would stand out. But just a little bit of data every day, maybe not so much. So again, like living off the land, low and slow behaviors uh, are how tools are used. Uh, but again, they're you know, fitting into the background noise. Uh, they're not standing out. Um, you can even go back to living off the land using common tools uh, in a low and slow manner. Now there's nothing remarkable about that. Hosts, every host or most hosts use these tools a little bit every day. So what's a little bit more? That's very hard to detect. Finally, encryption. Uh, While well, encryption doesn't uh, disguise or blend in to the background in the same way, other than in fact, you know, most network traffic is encrypted. Um, malware is now increasingly using uh, encryption as well. So roughly 90% of malware uses encryption. That number is going up. Uh, more and more are using it. Uh, and we saw uh, a 500% increase in ransomware using encrypted web protocols in 2020. Uh, that's a large number. Even if it's slightly less than that, that's still concerning. And the idea here is that encryption is hiding those standard indicators of compromise and other signatures that were previously used to detect malware or malware families. Um, and they're you know, being tucked into this encryption. So we can still see the exchange between the endpoints. Uh, we can still see the interaction, the, you know, the ports and different things being used, but we have much less visibility into the insides of the traffic uh, to see that happen. So what's the solution? Uh, behavioral analytics, we call it behavioral profiling. But the idea is that we're collecting data over weeks and months. So this is a long-term approach. Um, we're comparing hosts to their past behavior. So that requires a unique host ID based on IP and MAC address and other unique identifiers, domain names, things like that. Uh, and we're looking for anomalies in behavior over time. So um, you can see looking at data long term, you can see bursts in a particular period of time, whether you're tracking at the granularity of an hour or a day, uh, you can see those emerge above the, the typical uh, thresholds. Uh, you can also see steady increases over time. So, you know, an increasing slope of particular behaviors. Um, all of those become more visible when you see data across uh, a long horizon. Um, and the, the, the Key here is statistical power. The more data you have, the more ability you have to detect interesting effects um, to do that. The challenge is, of course, that this data is what we call heavy data. It requires a, a lot of machinery and um, infrastructure to manage network data well. Uh, network data is both high volume and velocity, and you can't just pump it into a database very easily, right? You need a data lake tool or some other um, mega data store uh, to manage and, and track all of that data. Typical organization might have hundreds of millions of flows a day. Uh, large organizations may have billions of flows a day. Um, so that needs to be managed thoughtfully and well. In addition, uh, heavy data, and network data isn't the only data in this, this category, um, satellite data, video data, audio data, um, they're all specialized, uh, unstructured data sets that require specialized tools to process, uh, potentially custom tools for certain applications uh, to, to fit within your organization. It's not like you can just typically grab an off-the-shelf storage tool and have all of your questions be able to be answered at, at scale. Um, you know, there are a lot of, of SIM tools um, that do store a lot of data, but they can, of course, be incredibly costly as they charge by the amount of data stored. So uh, that can lead to challenges down the road. So heavy data, the combination of the, the quantity and the specializedness of it that requires additional tools 
leads to something called data inertia. It's very difficult to do wide scale analysis or different types of analysis uh, because the data, data is so challenging to process and, and work with. And uh, that can be very frustrating uh, to do that. So we have to find some way to deal with this heavy data. Uh, one of the strategies that we use is something called mergeable sketches. A sketch is a data summary that lets you summarize the data, uh, keep the relevant sufficient statistics around, and discard the raw data. And if, if you choose sketches and summaries that are mergeable, that lets you do additional operations on that summary. So a simple example is a mean, right? If you just capture the mean and you capture means on different days, they aren't really comparable because you don't know how many records they uh, dealt with and you can't really combine them. But if you save both the mean and the count for the day, now suddenly the combination of those two numbers is a sketch that can be mergeable. And we can combine those means and, and mix and match them and do different analyses on that over time. Uh, the mean is the very simplest sketch. Uh, there are many other both um, precise and approximate uh, sketches, uh, including things like hyperlog log or account min sketch, uh, different quantile sketches like a t-digest uh, that lets you compute quantities over large amounts of data, store the relative parts, uh, and then merge them over time. So uh, now instead of large pyramids of data to keep a rolling window around, we can just keep a sketch for each window that we want. So for example, a day, uh, we can look at you know, keep our sketch for each day and then merge them together to form arbitrary large um, sliding historical windows. This is really important for us as, as we compute baselines, we can store the, the sketches for each day and then look back over those sketches to look for outliers and um, anomalies. So how does this work in real life? So let's look at, uh, particularly at, uh, for example, reconnaissance where an infected host is uh, scanning, looking for other vulnerable hosts that it can infect or collect data from or encrypt in the case of ransomware. Uh, it's a very common uh, malware strategy to, to scan uh, and look for vulnerabilities. So this can be active or passive scanning. Um, and we can look for baselines in a number of different ways. Number of unique hosts, so scanning requires talking to a, you know, a lot of hosts to look for those vulnerabilities. If a normal laptop or a normal workstation uh, doesn't typically uh, hit that many hosts in a day, that would then uh, indicate an anomaly. Uh, number of ports for a port scan or number of applications. Uh, there are a number of different ways to capture the, the scanning ability. Typically following scanning is, is lateral movement. And so lateral movement is a compound behavior where um, first a vulnerable host is found, uh, then data is transferred to that host or uh, you know, file, malware, some form of application, maybe it's configuration, uh, however it's operating. Uh, and then that next host becomes infected and repeats the behavior over time. And so it's really the combination of uh, those types of behaviors that lead to a confirmed lateral movement detection. The kinds of baselines that we're looking for there uh, include looking at applications like remote service usage. Uh, you know, how often are you connecting to RDP? How many bytes, how many packets are involved in those remote connections? Uh, what kind of file transfers are you making? Uh, who are you transferring those files to? Uh, so on and so forth. And then of course, looking for those new behaviors on new hosts that are adjacent uh, in the, the graph somehow. Third, there's a the use case of collection where valuable data is transferred to specific hosts in preparation for exfiltration. Uh, this is very often done in a low and slow manner where an infected host will reach out to other infected hosts and, and pull data or they'll push data to a staging point. Um, so this is the number of packets, the number of bytes, file transfer, application usage, um, both uh, data sent from a particular host, uh, but particularly data received uh, for the, the host where the staging is occurring. So we see more and more data uh, arriving at a particular host. That statistic summary for the bin, whether that's an hour, a day, a week, a month, really starts to accumulate. 
Uh, and then that's a strong indicator that some sort of behavior is happening there. So typically following data staging is exfiltration. Now the data has been collected and it's being exported out uh, to an external party outside of the network. Uh, again, this is a low and slow operation. Uh, and typically we're looking at packets, bytes, uh, potentially how many domains you access, uh, how many bytes you're sending to each domain, right? All of these are the kinds of long-term behavioral analyses that give you a picture into what you know, how this host behaves on a regular basis. Uh, and we can watch those over time and look for large amounts of data going out with that. And again, it doesn't have to happen in one time period. Uh, we can see trends, uh, change points where uh, your standard daily transfer might go up for a short period of time um, for several days and then go back down. Um, so it, it Individually, it may not exceed a particular threshold, but collectively over a period of three to five days, uh, we might see that operation come out. So there's uh, multiple ways of looking at that. So to wrap up, uh, attackers already have access to the network, making it challenging to detect malicious behaviors. A long-term data analysis is the solution uh, for detecting these kinds of adversarial tactics. But long-term analysis can be difficult to perform due to the extreme amounts of data. So we've, we've taken some of the latest and greatest in statistical processing uh, to combine encrypted traffic analysis with efficient a long-term baseline to detect all phases of an attack. So we still have a few minutes for questions. Happy to take them now. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so we did have a few questions that came through from the audience today, so I want to make sure we address those. Um, the first one is, if the attackers are already in the network, won't that spoil the baseline? Absolutely. So that's a great question. Uh, the It's something that we have to account for, right? Because um, if you're taking what's normal or standard, uh, then that'll sort of blend in. So a couple of ways that we address that. First is that we look over as much time as we have possible. So we can uh, use those sketches to store longer time histories to give us a, a better window. Uh, but more importantly, eventually something different is going to happen. A new host is uh, you know, infected, uh, more data is transferred, and the more baselines we compute, uh, so we compute many different baselines and a lot of different uh, fields and approaches, uh, that gives us a pretty fine-grained indicator of, of when something changes. So yes, they may be in there. Still, at some point, uh, that infection or that uh, attack is going to escalate. Something will change, and we, we hope to detect it at that point. Great. Um, another question was, how many days do you need to get a good indicator of anomalies? Right. So uh, it, that the right answer really depends on the system. Some systems are very consistent um, in very tight bands of bandwidth or applications or other things. Um, and so only a few days are needed. Uh, other systems are more variable. Uh, maybe it's a, a laptop that shows up some days and disappears other days. Um, they'll take longer. Our system is designed to work um, starting on day two basically to compute baselines looking at the history uh, and looking for outliers uh, and again uh, the the combination of multiple outliers can give us uh, a better indicator of when something is happening great um, another one we got was how do you identify false positives right so false positives are always a problem uh, too many and uh, uh, alert streams get turned off. Um, again, the, the secret here is in what we call triangulation. So uh, using multiple viewpoints to come into a particular conclusion. Um, so just because one baseline itself uh, goes off and, and discovers anomaly, it may not be enough to uh, start an investigation. So we're looking for multiple baselines, possibly correlations with other indicators. Uh, to do that. And so because of our machine learning approach, we can take all of these different indicators 
into account before we give the final score. So just because we're finding an anomaly doesn't mean that that's automatically an alert. Uh, that it's still reported as a finding. We can look that up and say, hey, some this particular laptop had a had an anomaly on it. Uh, but it's not necessarily worthy of an investigation until we have other corroborating evidence uh, and our system can pull all of that together as well. Great. Um, sounds great. Thanks so much. That was the end of our questions for today. If uh, anyone has any additional questions that maybe pop up on the mind going forward, um, you're always welcome to reach out to us. Um, and I'll, I'll show you where we can get the, that sent out to you so you can have access to those links. Um, so overall, today you've heard about how you can detect and analyze these active threat actors in your network, and hopefully you've had some time now to gain some additional insights into how live action solutions work and how they can help enable security operations teams to address some of these key security challenges. Um, for some additional insight, you can get uh, a full picture of how live action can help deliver some of these successful security operations by not only reviewing this session today, uh, but we also have past webinars that you are able to look at or share out with a colleague. Um, our channel on Bright Talk has a list of all of our past webinars that you can review. If you'd like to have a little bit more of a personalized one-on-one -on -one demonstration session with you and your team, we can get that set up for you as well. Um, we also have free trials of ThreadEye that you can try out within your own network today. Links to all of these as well as some additional resources uh, like data sheets and white papers are in the attachments tab of this webinar. So you, go, uh, you can go review those. Uh, that'll also help guide you to where you can uh, continue to reach out to us if there's additional questions. So with that, I want to thank all of you for attending today's webinar and remind you that we do have part three of our Detecting Advanced Threats series coming up here on March 2nd. So you want to make sure to keep an eye out for that and pre-register so that you don't miss out. Thank you all again for joining and we look forward to seeing you again here in March.